in the remaining time of this class we would be revisiting the notion of functions before that i want to again review the not review actually introduce the concept of a const qualifier a constant qualifier once we look at the constant qualifier and the function prototypes we will continue to discuss classes and how to construct classes you'll remember from last lectures that we have looked actually at two classes now what i will be doing by the way not only in this lecture but in the rest of the course i will actually be following kuhun's book this is to ensure that you have a material to read after you go back home so i will be discussing problems and i'll be discussing explanations of the features from kuhun's book usually the class description that we will be discussing today belongs to chapter 8 of kuhun but usually there will be some attendant issues which are related to that discussion what i'll do is every time i refer to those i will mention the corresponding chapter and section of the kuhun's book so that you can refer to that portion when you go back and read up some so first what i discuss of course has nothing to do with kuhun's book it is a general discussion let us look at the constant qualifier first usually whenever you have your variables the variables can change in value the only thing that you are familiar with which has a constant value is actually not a variable but a symbol which you define as a part of the pre processor macro definitions so for example if you say hash define max as 100 then we know that wherever the word max is used in your program it is actually replaced by string 100 so it is not really a constant value of a variable but it is actually a text which is changed many times we would like that when we say for example in m we are permitted to declare an initial value for that int m so i might say int m equal to 500 now what i want is that while i might have other ints say int k l or whatever i might change the value of k sometime like this i might change the value of l as equal to k star m or whatever but i might also change the value of m which may become say 200 all these are permitted statements because klm are normal integer variables and their values can be changed if i wish that some of these variables should not change their values during the execution of the program they must remain fixed to the initial value that they have been allocated if i want that to happen then what is the feature that i have that feature is called the constant qualifier for example if while declaring this int m if i said const int m equal to 100 now this tells the compiler that while i want m to be a variable that has to be allocated space and value 500 has to be given there but this value 500 should never change during the execution of the program if later the compiler finds a statement of this type m is equal to say k plus l or whatever it will flag this as an error because you are attempting to change m which has been defined with a constant qualifier now this is your way of defining not through a macro which replaces text inside your text while compiling but through a variable these const definitions are useful whenever you are passing parameters to functions which are passed through reference which means that you would get back the corresponding parameter if it is changed in the function you may want to ensure in the function that a certain parameter which you have received while it might have been a pointer and you are entitled to change that value this function should not change the value you want to ensure that some parameter should not change the value then you can use the const qualifier in the formal parameter when you say some parameter is const what it means is 
independent of who has called it how, the value of this parameter will not change in the function. That is the object. Let us look at functions and prototypes. <coughs> you are all familiar with the fact that in my program, I can write, let us say I want to write a function. You all understand this main program? In this main program, I have declared two floating point variables, y and r. I am collecting the value of y as input. And then I have an expression, r is equal to f in bracket y plus 3.416. You look at this program from a compiler's viewpoint. While compiler is compiling this program, it will come to this particular point, this particular expression, and you start looking at f in bracket y. The compiler has two options. Either f is an array, in which case yth element could have been referred to, but then it should have found a square bracket. So it is obviously not an array. Then this must be a function. That is how the compiler concludes that it is a function. During compilation, it finds out that f must be the name of the function. It must be returning some value which is valid for this expression evaluation. This value could be integer, this value could be real. It doesn't know what that return value is. However, it knows that this y has to be a parameter which will have to go to that function and this y is flow. At this juncture, it must know the function definition to resolve these two issues. A, whether the parameters that are being passed to the function are correct. There are two, three parameters and they are in right sequence, in right type or not, and B, what is going to be the return value? Because then only it will be creating a place for holding that return value and using it top. That is the reason why you write your function definition before the main program, so that the compiler will know what that entire option is. So here, for example, I might write a function which will say float F Can you understand this function? It's a simple function. It's actually finding out the value of 20.94x square for any given parameter x. So you understand now how this function will be compiled and used during execution. There is, there is no problem here. In this main program, whenever f of y is called, this y as an actual parameter will go and get copied into this x, which is internally a formal parameter for this function. I have declared float result in this. The result will be calculated and the result will be returned. It is in line with the description float f which means the return value is floating point and that value will come back here. If I write this function here and if I write the main program here, then the compiler understands fully everything about it needs to understand. It in fact also understands how the function is computed because this entire code is given here. Now, this way of writing function ensures that you have written two important things about a function at a single place. What are the two important things? One is the function definition. The first line a function definition needs to define what is the return type of value that the function sends and what are the parameters that the function expects. There may be three, four, five parameters. Some parameter may be a char array, some may be integer, some may be floating point. And we are already familiar with the fact that the order in which these parameters appear is important because the corresponding parameters will come from the calling program and sit there. One thing I would like you to again understand that as far as the compiler is concerned, the compiler needs to know only the function definition while compiling the main program. Whether it is calculating 20.94x square 
or whether it is calculating 33 x cube or whatever is immaterial for compiler that is part of the implementation so all of this is function implementation so we must appreciate that there are two parts of a function writing a definition and implementation and that the definition is required while compiling your main program without the definition the compiler will not know what is the name of the function what value it returns and what are the parameters it takes given this c++ permits you to separate out these two parts while you write your program so you can write only the definition at the time of writing your main program and you can write the implementation anywhere that you want how is exactly this handled so let us understand this if i write this at the top and then start writing int main this is considered perfectly valid because for compiler the only thing required to know is name of the function return value and parameters this is called a function prototype of course the body of the function which implements the function has to be written somewhere in normal practice the option given is after your main program ends you can write again the float function f etc etc and write the entire implementation of course you have to repeat that function title in order to implement but it is possible that this entire implementation is written separately the entire implementation is written separately there are two things about prototype and implementation separation and prototype writing that you must additionally know first this prototype definition is a detailed definition but whatever i have written here as float x can also be written more simply as float f please note that this is also a valid prototype definition why actually in prototype the physical location where the parameter value is to be copied is not relevant that will come in the definition of the implementation but for, for compiling what it must know is that it has one parameter and the parameter is float that much is sufficient that is why you will find in many examples the prototype definition does not contain a name of a variable or an array or anything it just contains the type of value that it is supposed to receive which is adequate from the point of view of compilation the detailed explanation of this would be detailed writing of the variables arrays etc must happen subsequently now consider so as i said this implementation could be separate usually the implementation is given immediately after the declaration of the function name so prototype and implementation are together and in such cases you must use the first version of the prototype definition namely this version if you are writing the function implementation there itself but if you are separating this prototype is okay now how does the separation work the separation has two components as i said the function definition and the function implementation let us generalize this to say the following i have written a program in which i have three function prototypes defined notice here that the second function that has been defined has an array int array if i just said int it will assume that a single value has to come int array implies what int array implies that it will receive a pointer a pointer to the zeroth element of that array i could have very well written this simply as int star because that's a pointer so that is 
if I want to indicate that I receive a pointer, I will have to say int star, char star or whatever. If I am implying that it is supposed to receive a variable, I have to give just the type. That is the prototype definition. Now we talk of the separation. These prototype definitions, F1, F2, F3 that you see, will generally result from the fact that some other people, let us say my colleagues in my lab batch have written these functions. These functions will exist in their own uh, directory. When I am writing my main program, I may not have those functions. So I may, if I have, say such 20 functions, I will have to list these 20 functions. If another friend is writing another main program, that person will also have to list these 20 functions. Not only that, for the correct execution, I will have to also somewhere compile the implementation of these 20 functions as well and collect everything together. The separation permits me to do two things. First, the separation of these prototype definitions. This, these can be separated out and put inside, sorry, put inside a header file. All of these, just the, just the function definitions. I can put them in a header file. And when I put them in a header file, I can put here a single statement which says include, you would have seen some such includes in some of the programs that you run. The idea is that when I write my main program, I know I am going to use one of these 20 functions. I do not have to write all those 20. Somebody who has written these 20 functions has collected the definitions of the prototype separately, which is called fun.h, let us say. As long as I include that, that is all. When I include it using double quotes, the convention is that the operating system will first search in the current directory in which I am compiling my program. And if it does not find it, it may go to the include directories which have been defined. We will have a separate discussion on what compiler directives to give for such inclusion as well as the inclusion of library compiled functions which I have just mentioned in a moment. So this is the first separation. That means I do not have to write any one of these. What about the implementation of the functions? Ordinarily these implementations would have come here, function 1, function 2, function 3 and this could be let us say 100 lines of C++ code each function 20 lines, 30 lines, etc. And I would be forced to include that and compile it. But if these functions have been written by someone else, just as that someone else has created fun.h, someone else could create a separate file called funcollection.cpp, let us say. This fun.cpp does not include main program. It has only these 20 function implementation, the logic, 23.4 multiplied by x into x, etc. That function definition. Now, ultimately my program, which is the main program, has to be compiled with the function definitions all right. But when the program is to be converted into an executable file, it should have the compiled versions of these functions also linked to it. There are two options of doing it. Just like I include fun.h, I can also include fun.cpp. Then the fun.cpp in the text will be included and everything will be compiled together and an executable will be formed. The other option is compile these separately, but create a file called fun.o not a a.out file. a.out file cannot be created because there is no main program. But I can give a compiler directive, which we shall study later, by which I can tell the compiler, hey, Baba, compile these 20 functions, but do not attempt to produce a compiled version, produce a dot .o version. In fact, a dot .o version will be produced for every individual function that you have. You can compile each one separately or compile a collection you will get a dot .o file. Now this dot .o file is the compiled version of the functions. I now suddenly have the following choice. First, I will say fun.h and I will say include fun.h. So I do not have to write all of these. The fun.h is included which is the definitions of the function. Then I write my main program. 
and after com ask uh, afterwards i give the compiler only my main program and the function definition so when i say c++ but this time i will say don't produce an executable version in fact you can't because there are functions whose implementation is not known instead produce a dot o file of my main program assume that this all this process produces a dot o file so it produces a file a dot o this is different from a dot out a dot o is a compiled version but not ready to run but for doing that i don't require anything about the functions now i can ask the compiler that the a dot o file that you have produced in the first phase please link it with fun dot o and then produce a dot o so a dot o plus fun dot o should give me a dot o this feature is available with all c++ compilers the linking phase is the phase where such linking happens those of you who have attempted to run ez windows will know that when you write ez windows programs you have the include something dot h something dot h files at the top then you write your main program but where are the actual complete class implementations you have not written them you are not including anything for the class definitions and yet the program works how it works is when you compile you don't say normally c++ api man you compile it using a special script called compile script have some of you seen what is there inside that compile script compile there is a command api compile or compile which actually has c++ something which produces a dot o file and then it is followed by another c++ command which links libraries which are pre compiled versions of these classes along with your compiled version so that is the facility that is available invariably in developing large programs that is what you would be doing using this now we will revisit the notion of classes because classes are nothing but an implementation of what you may call abstract data types and their manipulations using functions which are written specifically for that the notion of a class makes it a much better abstraction then an ordinary abstraction that we have used for data structures such as struct you remember struct we had defined struct and then we could use an array of struct if we wanted so struct became some kind of an abstract data type for us it is not a full fledged abstract data type an abstract data type should have facilities for manipulation similar to the normal data types in this context we had seen some uh, class examples today we will look at the example of rational numbers as i said rational numbers are of the form a by b where a is an integer b is also an integer okay so i have a pair of numbers this pair describes a rational number if i want to do a upon b plus c upon d then i know that this is equal to ad plus bc divided by bd so i know how to operate upon rational numbers what are the operations that i can can conduct on rational numbers add subtract multiply divide what is the advantage of retaining the final results in the rational number form i avoid any loss of precision in my calculations due to that floating point limited so i can actually conduct all my computations in rational numbers and ultimately the final result i can convert into a floating that is one way of looking at it how do i implement rational numbers well i can write a program where i can write a struct where i say int a int b and i can define variables of the type struct and every time refer to this part and this part and implement everything here but then the implementation of the rational number and operations on the rational numbers will be visible to anybody who reads my main program and somebody wants to change the main program for something else that person might by mistake change some fundamental aspects which implement the rational number operations 
which is detrimental because I would have tested all those operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication. So what I would like to do, I would like to create a structure in which rational numbers are handled, but to the end user I will say, I have defined this structure, I have defined functions for adding, subtracting, multiplying, just use them. This is where the class notion helps us enormous. Let us look at one particular implementation. I have written a main program and a function. First, let us see the main program. This is the main program. This main program assumes that there is a class of rational numbers defined somewhere. And it attempts to use that class and its behavior. In this class, I am saying rational C1. What it means? That an object C1 of the rational type should be created. Then I am defining another object C2. But I, in bracket I have said 3 comma 4. What it should mean? Generally you can guess. I am defining another object of rational whose value is 3 by 4. Third object 1 by 3. Then I am using a function display C1. I expect that the display C1 should be able to display the numerator part and the denominator part. This function is not part of the standard class which somebody has written for me, the rational class. So I will be writing this function myself. I have another function here which says R add. R add should stand for rational add. I am going to pass two parameters to it. One is an object C2, another is an object C3. And this R add function is actually a member function of the rational class itself. So the fourth object C4 I have written here. C4 dot R add. C4 dot R add C2 comma C3. I expect C2 and C3 are added in the rational number arithmetic sense and the result should become now my C4. So the C4 component should be appropriately changed based on this addition. This is how I have written the program. As I said, we will look at the display function that I have written. So this function says white display rational C. It will expect a object of the type rational here. The implementation is given here. It says to display a rational number in two forms. In A by B form as also as a floating point value. So I have declared here float x int A comma B. Now I say C dot R components A comma B. What does it mean? C dot R components means components of the rational. When I say C dot R components, it must be a member function of the C. And when I say A comma B, I expect the A comma B components of this to become available to me. Now I can say X is equal to float A by float B. And I can pr print the number as A and B and equivalent floating number as this. In this particular case, I am doing an important mistake. Why is that mi is mistake and why it is important? I am assuming that the private data members of a class are accessible to me. Usually, you would like to hide everything that is private to an object. So this is not a good implementation. I, have, I will be including on the Moodle this small program as well as my initial version of the implementation of class rational. And I will indicate by notes what is wrong with this implement. One of these things that I mentioned that the way I have written it, I would of course have R components as one member function. Okay, I would have the constructors of different types and I would have R add as another member function. Then I will mention why this implementation is not a good implementation. What should be a good implementation? The good implementation to, should do variety of things. For example, instead of having a function called add two objects, multiply two objects, suppose I have a class, this time I will change the class, I will call it with capital R, R rational. Suppose I have these objects, C1, C2, C3. And I have initialized 
let's say I have initialized C1 as 2, 3 and C2 as 3, 4. Now I would like to say somewhere in my main program C3 is equal to C1 plus C2. Do you agree? Because I am adding two rational numbers. So I would like to use the plus symbol of C++ which implies addition of integers, which implies addition of floating point. I would like to say I want to add two rational numbers and the addition is in the same spirit that it does addition of integer or floating point. So I would like to say that. I would like to use the same symbol for division for uh, what you call uh, multiplication etc. More importantly, consider my input and output statements. I have a statement C in by which I can input X, Y, Z. I would also like to say in C4. Isn't it? Input a rational number. I know that rational number has two parts. If you tell me in what format I should give the rational number, why should I have to read if I had a structure, for example, struct R and then read C in R dot A, R dot B. That is what I would be doing if I had defined a structure. But if I have an object, I would like to do this. I would similarly like to do this. That is the power of expression that is possible because C++ permits you not only to define your ob classes and object characteristics, but it also permits you to define or rather redefine or extend the definition of normal operators which exist in C++. So the normal operator in C++, which is the plus symbol, means addition. You extend the meaning of it. Of course, how it will not automatically extend. When you define the object class for rational, you will have to give statements saying this is the meaning of that extension. Such an extension is called overloading of operators. So in this case, the operator plus is overloaded. You can overload minus, slash, star, etc. You can also overload greater, greater and less, less symbols. You may not be aware, but these symbols are actually operators in C++. The greater, greater symbol is called extract operator. Okay. It extracts from an input stream of characters and converts it into a proper value like integer and float. This operator is called an insert operator. It inserts the converted text into an output stream. And these operators are defined in the context of streams of data. One is input stream, the other is output stream. These are called I stream and O stream, of which C in and C out are merely some special manifestation. We shall be studying these later in the class, but today we will understand that this is possible. What we will do is, we will very quickly glance through the definition of the class. We will be discussing the class rational in greater details on Friday. And this class has been described completely in, we will not spend too much time. I want to spend just five minutes, but I would like to advise you the following. Please read chapter 8 of Kuhun before you come to the next lecture on Friday. Because that chapter 8 describes the complete detailed description of the rational class starting with the ra rational for defining such a class. It starts with the definition of member data elements, member functions and it introduces a few new terms which we will discuss on Friday. So if you have studied chapter 8 before coming to the class, you will be able to understand things more rapidly. Here we are just looking at it. Some comments I have added, these are not there in Cohen's book. So this is a class to handle rational numbers, objects are of the type A by B. Now I am defining private data members, int n value and int d value. It's easy to understand, numerator and denominator. Now I am defining member functions. Look at the constructors. Rational, rational int comma int. It means I can give a default constructor and I can give a constructor with two parameters. They have to be implemented here. The implementation of rational bracket open bracket close could give some default value. The best default value for the rational 
is 0 by 1. It is almost like setting something to 0. Initializing integers or float to 0 is natural. Initializing a rational to 0 is also natural. But 0 by something you have to say. Denominator cannot be 0. You set it to 1. In case I set it to int comma int, then the first int is numerator, second int is denominator. That is implied. Now, there are mutators and inspectors. A mutator is a function which sets the value for private data memory. And an inspector is a function which inspects the value of a data member and gives you. Set value, set n value, set d value. Natural, numerator value, denominator value. Int get value, int get n value, int get d value. Again, natural, whatever object it is operating upon, it will take the numerator and return it as int, it will take this and return it as int. Here I have shown them as public member function. In actual implementations, they are not public member function. They are functions called protected function. A protected a public member function can be used by you in your main program. But a protected function cannot be used by you. That means, in your main program, you can never write set n value, set d value, set get n value, get d value. You cannot never write. What is the objective of such protection? The object is now being completely protected from you. The internal data members, you can never access directly. Never. That is a, that is a encapsulation and hiding principle which goes very strongly to write clean software. Now, you would still like to know what are the values, but are you interested in the components? You are interested in the operations on those rational. You are interested in ensuring that an initialized rational value exists and operations can exist. That can be done using protected functions because protected functions can be used by other member functions of the class, but you can't use them. Here is a R add function which I have written. It has two rational things. Now I have these constructors. Notice that the constructors are using set n value, set d value, etc. Et we'll discuss these things in details. I've just given you a glimpse of how the rational class is being defined and we'll discuss the details of the implementation on the Friday lecture. Thank you. <laughs>